let everybody get their cameras fired up. Go live. Is that what we're doing? Is everyone yeah. living? Living, yeah. living, living. Oh, then you got these guys over here. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Just how it is. Do it's like. continue with this. Live. live. And then turn it how you want it before you hit live because you're stuck to when you say go. When you say go, you are stuck. We are live. You don't know we start. Nobody else says that but me. I'm like, we are live. We are live. Yeah, that's what you do, right? <laughs> Puts everyone on notice. Yeah, a lot. That's what I do. <laughs> I do it all the time. Really live. Well, you can say you're not being recorded. I do. No, I say it all the time. I'm like, okay, and we are live. I'm like, why do I want to say that? I don't know, but it reminds myself of that. All right. So uh, we're going to go through and demo distress blazes, and I'll talk about other new things that we have in the world of distress. The reason I'm excited about distress embossing blazes that we just have a different way to distress. I didn't invent embossing powder by any mean. I'm not saying that this embossing powder uh, has a unique formulation or anything like that, but I'll tell you about its properties. And to me, that's what makes it unique because embossing powder is plastic. And in our world of embossing, most embossing powders are designed to be opaque. Black embossing powder, white embossing powder, metallics. And that is something that when we applied it to the surface and we melt it, it's gonna give us that opaque, shiny texture, that dimension. And there's a variety of other embossing powders. There's some that have transparent factors. There's some that have a mixture of uh, particle sizes and pieces that do cool things. I wanted a line of strictly translucent embossing powders. Embossing powders that would have a really nice grind. It's not ultra fine, but it's not a standard grind. It's somewhere in between. And its color would actually coordinate with the distress line once it melts, all right? And the glaze is designed to be put on top of stuff, like a glazed donut. You're gonna put it on as a topping. So the colors, and I'll just go through them right here. There are 12 colors in the line. We have Tattered Rose, Fired Brick, Rusty Hinge, Fossilized Amber, Cracked Pistachio, Peeled Paint, ooh, that's a good one. Uh, Broken China, we have a little Weathered Wood, Antique Linen, Vintage Photo, Walnut Stain, Hickory Smoke. Now these are all applied to a white background that has been stamped, as well as an ideology baseboard doll. And I'll take you through and talk about the techniques behind them. What's unique about the glaze, and because they're always transparent, is that when you put it over something, it actually intensifies what you put it over. So for example, we'll just take a tag. This is perfect with fired brick. This is stamped in black, right? But when this is glazed with fired brick, it makes that black even darker than what it was initially stamped in, right? There are no inks used on any of these tags. The color all comes from the glaze, right? This is applied with a clear ink, and when you apply the glaze and you melt it, that is what's giving you the color and the texture. And there's different ways that we can apply these embossing glazes. You can use any kind of embossing ink, right? I happen to like Distress Embossing Ink, but whatever your favorite embossing jam is, go for it. You can also use an embossing pen. Now we have Distress Embossing Pens, but there's nothing significant about these other than the fact that they're part of the Distress line. So it makes it much easier for retailers to say, okay, these work with these. But if you have an embossing pen, any kind of embossing ink is going to work with the glaze. This set has a brush and a bullet, and that is what allows me to apply clear embossing ink to a certain area and emboss, and I'll demo that. But one of my most favorites is the embossing dabber. Now, Ranger has had an embossing dabber in the line for quite a long time, and their embossing dabber has a foam top, like a pink dabber. I wanted my dabber to have a felt top, like a stamp cleaner. And the reason is, is you only need a little bit of embossing ink to get this powder to stick. Okay, if you put too much ink on a surface, especially in mixed media, it becomes too greasy and your enamels won't stick to things. So even if you're doing background stamps, or for example, all of these tags that have that really cool kind of broken edge, that's just because I can take the embossing dabber, dab it down, and you can see that just the ink comes out just from dabbing. You can also see that someone decided to use it over <laughs> something else. But that's okay, it makes, it makes for a better video. But I can just swipe this over the surface and you can see how easy it is to spread out that shine, that little bit of embossing ink. So now this will allow me to go around the edges of stuff if I wanted to put glaze or any embossing powder. So you can use these inks with your standard powders. If you have big background stamps, if you're gonna put it on a stamp, I would suggest dabbing it around the stamp several times because you can see that it applies the ink and then just go in and spread it out. This is not an embossing squeezy. So don't squeeze the bottle or you'll blow the top off. Okay, so you need to make sure you press down to open up that dabber. All right, I'm just gonna do some demos and then I'll get into some of the other distress mediums because there's a lot of cool, fun things that we can do with distress. 
when it comes to the glaze, understanding its translucency is what's going to make this, I think, more exciting as a maker. Because when you put it over something, like for example, this inked background, when that color melts, you're still gonna be able to see all of the ink splots, all of the, the little stains and marks that you've done on your background, because all of these colors are translucent. We're gonna always see through them. If you put it over something like, for example, oxide. So this just shows a tag with distress oxide. Down here is clear embossing powder. Because you might be thinking, oh, I'll just use clear and it will just kind of give me something similar. No, this is clear and this is what fired brick glaze does. So fired brick glaze just makes much more color, much more shine, but it also brings out those undertones way better than just a clear surface. So you can use it on top of other colors. You can use the glaze with a stamp. So if you had a mixed media background, this is just weathered wood. So it's a stamped in clear and embossed in weathered wood glaze. But the nice thing about this, because it's a translucent blue, is that color changes from when it's over cracked pistachio, when it's over faded jeans, when it's over the little dusty concord, and when it's over rusty hinge. That color of glaze has changed. So it adapts to what you put it over. So when you, if you wanted to say stamp in a dark blue and emboss in a light glaze, well you're gonna create a whole new color than if you just use this with clear. Right? If you do this with weathered wood, it would be even more intense than what it is now. So I can't wait for people to start using them by mixing and matching their Distress inks, their oxides, and of course, lay it over their backgrounds. When you apply it, pretty, pretty simple. I'll just take a doll, a baseboard doll. That'll be fun. There we go. We'll use this one. These are nice little, nice little fur coat. Yeah, he doesn't want that. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. All right, we're going to take a pen and I'm going to use the brush tip and I'm just going to start coloring. Now, when you apply this, and I'll just kind of show you, as soon as you apply it to the surface, it is a clear ink, but can you see, I don't know if your video is catching, it is a very wet ink that's going on there. So usually when I kind of tip it in the light, you'll see that it's really wet and really shiny. And that's what I'm looking at. I'm just looking at where this clear ink is going. I often find that it's easier when I hold it, when I just place it flat, because I can just kind of turn my head. I can go around and say, okay, I'm gonna just leave her bag plain, perfect. Go across there, look up here, go around her collar, perfect. And you can also go in with the bullet. So if you wanted something that's gonna be a little bit more detailed because maybe you're going to do uh, drawing or lettering or anything like that, you can certainly do that with a different type of pen. All right, let's see, do I have that? Yeah, I still wanna kind of keep her hand covered. All right. I don't normally do a doll that big for them. All right, let's take something. Uh, I don't want to use that. I don't want to use that. I'm going to do a little vintage photo. I like that color a lot. So what we're going to do is take the glaze, pour it over the top. Use the jar just to tap off the excess. There we go. Keep your hands clear. Keep the bag clear. So if I wanted to use a second color, I would still emboss this. And then I would go in with a pen again, add a second color, emboss it the second time. I wouldn't try to put both colors of powder down at the same time because even if you try to do that little mark and you put green powder, it's still statically gonna charge to other things, right? So we'll put this back. Bring your carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so much color over there. And then we're going to emboss it. So I'm gonna use an embossing gun. An embossing gun is different than a craft tool in a sense that they're both the same temperature, right? Same heat temperature, but this one's gonna focus heat. And that's what's going to melt the embossing powder. Any embossing powder that's on the market is all made of plastic. It's just ground up plastic. And all we're doing is we're re-melting that plastic back to a solid state. So you can see that the glazes, they don't take long to melt at all. Once they melt, you can see that true color, that wonderful vintage photo. Now we're seeing those undertones right there move my finger out of the way and continue to go and finish embossing that. Really cool. So this just creates that beautiful... Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so this creates that wonderful glaze tinted look and we can still use markers, we can still use distress crayons, you could have used any of that over it. But that color and that shine, that to me is magic. That's what creates that whole effect. So I could still go in and tint that however I want. The glaze really, when you work with it, can be used on a variety of substrates, not just paper. We can use our glazes for mixed media, for example, metal. So Vicki Evans at Crazy Chick did this project. You can see just an ideology metal clip. 
a little bit of gesso and some hickory smoke glaze and look at that. And by adding that little bit of gesso, you can see that white, that's what's gonna create the light areas of gray. And when that glaze hits the metal, it creates dark areas. So that gives us almost like a galvanized look over our metal. So this is just done just using the dabber. Put that on, use your fingers or a brush to kind of move around a very thin layer and apply that to the surface. You can also use it on things like wood. So let's say you wanted to put glaze. For example, if you look on these number blocks, it has glaze, but the glaze isn't nearly as shiny as this. Okay? One of the great tricks with any kind of embossing powder is after it is embossed and cooled, you can go over it with steel wool and it will take away the shine. So it looks like wax. So even if you were just using regular embossing powder and you wanted to put it on a card but make it look like you did wax, you could put that on, use some steel wool and actually create that look of wax. Pretty awesome. So taking this to a different approach, and that is taking these glazes and using it on backgrounds. Okay, let's, let's say we wanted to use it with different kind of paste or backgrounds. One of the things I love about these powders is the fact that they're not super coarse, they're not super chunky, and that's going to allow me to use them, I think the ways that I would normally want to use an embossing powder, which is maybe over a background. Maybe I want to take this background and I'll add, I think I'll add some brown. Shocker, I know, create yourself. <laughs> throw a curveball and use hickory smoke. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I'm just going to take some glaze and I'll actually go with a little bit of water, put some in my hand and just flick this down. We can take the glaze and we can go in and emboss with water. Okay? So any of those flicks, any of that splatter that we did, we can go in with water because oh, that is no. awesome. Please. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so those cool splatters are now going to be embossable. Now I will tell you that when you go in and emboss water, you need to work immediately, right? There's no ink oh, under there now. Right. So we need to make sure this powder melts before the water dries, right? Totally makes sense. Yeah, and that's going to be enough to allow this powder to melt and then that water evaporates almost simultaneously. So it's really a great way that we can create a distressed effect oh. in a totally different way. So whether we're spraying, like I just chose to flick water, but maybe you don't want to flick water. Maybe you actually wanted to go in and spray it through a stencil. That would work as well. But I like what the effect of water does with these glazes, and you'll see what I mean. It creates a very, very translucent, very fluid effect over this tag. It's just awesome. Really, really a lot of fun. That we've used before. Yes. How, how much the pen is going to be probably between seven to ten minutes. Yeah, it's a very, very wet pen. Embossing ink is glycerin, so it takes almost forever to dry, if ever. But it also depends on what you're putting it on, right? Oh, that if is your surface cool. is super porous, then it's going to dry quicker. But yeah, I'll hold this in so you guys can see. Take a look at that. Just those great little dots that just kind of splattered around. Just using those glazes with water. So the way you like to distress, you know, flick some water on, put some glaze, heat it. Flick some more water on, put a different color of glaze, heat that. Go through a stencil. So it doesn't always have to be with ink, but of course it can. So you can emboss with not only embossing ink, distress ink, oxide. We can use other mixed media things like paste. So I'll talk about that. We've introduced two new paste to the distress line. I knew I would have one that I needed. What did I tell you? I will go back in the basket. Uh -huh. <laughs> Here it is. Because it's not my thing. Okay. <laughs> so texture paste. Texture paste is, this is uh, Ranger texture paste. So these have always been in the Ranger line. They just moved them over to the Distress line. So we have texture paste matte and crackle. And these are paste. And the reason it got moved over to the line is because of the makers. So shout out to the makers. Shout out to the makers. <laughs> because by you guys using the Ranger product more with Distress, that just says, well, it makes sense that it's in the distress line. And it really does because it, it, it just reminds you that, yes, these products work perfect with distress. So the matte texture paste is this matte paste that's very thick, but it's also very porous when it dries. So when this dries, we can ink this with oxide, distress ink, distress spray stain, distress paint, and that's a great way to colorize it. We can also emboss it. So this is a glazed version of this paste. So I'll demo that too. The other one is crackle. Crackle's very cool because you put it on and it cracks when it dries. Whether you apply it with a palette knife, a brush, your finger, it's going to crack no matter what. Obviously, the thicker the 
the medium, the bigger the cracks, the finer, the finer the cracks, but it will crack. That's a nice thing about this paste. You don't have to worry about, oh, is it gonna work? So for those people that are crack challenged, you know, we you know, <laughs> when you had a candy or crazy, and you're like, oh, I need to put this on, it's not working. This is gonna do that. And I love the fact that we can go in and color. You laugh because it's true. <laughs> You've got to put crack, we're like, well, that didn't work. Let's put some more on it. <laughs> so when it comes to the paste, I'm going to just use the matte paste. I'll take that, I'm going to take a palette knife, and I'm going to choose some colors. This has been kind of a nice little patina blend. It doesn't have to be that. I'll do a little greeny, browny, lighty color. So I'm going to go with some weathered wood. It's by nobody. It's, it has no markings whatsoever. Zero. <laughs> In the plastic. Sorry, Judas. I just like it. Um, I always like a heat tool that has that plastic tip, I'll tell you that. If you've ever been zinged by a hot, oh. yeah, you only need to have it once. So, I uh, still so has that metal tip that other embossing guns have, but it's protected. So, I don't know. I like it. I said to Ranger, I'm like, we need an actual embossing gun, guys. Like, that would be really nice. And it doesn't seem as loud as it's others that I hear. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. have that loud, like, whizzing sound. All right. All right. So, I'm just going to open up some glazes. These are going to be my colors. I really like those colors. And... I'll take my surface. This could be anything. This could have been a piece of chipboard. This could be a vignette. I'm just demoing on a piece of paper. When you pick up paste, you're gonna pick it up on the bottom of a palette knife, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna place it through a stencil. So we're gonna smear that through, spread it out through whatever part of the stencil we want, and then we're gonna skim off the top. Good rule to follow whenever you're doing any kind of paste through a stencil is if you cannot see your design, it's too much medium. If you pick up the stencil, that paste will collapse into it and you'll lose your design. Doesn't mean you have to go in and like dig everything out. Just kind of lightly skim it over the top and as long as you can see your stencil, which having a stained stencil is like a bonus for this because it's easier to see, but that's going to be enough paste. Then we'll take, put the lid on. We're just going to lift the stencil up. And we're going to place this in water. This goes in cold water, warm water, it doesn't matter. It's the easiest way to clean a stencil. Throw it in water when it's wet, everything will literally dissolve and you take out the stencil and dry it. You don't have to scrub your stencil and risk ruining your stencil. So now we've got this and while the paste is wet, we're going to go in and essentially paint with powder. So I'm just gonna take those glazes and just use my fingers and I'm kind of, I'm twisting my fingers together like this. Right, so that's what's keeping me from like opening this up and just dropping it, right? Just twisting them together. And that gives me a little bit more control as far as color placement. Throwing down some colors that I just want to work with. A little bit of peeled paint, that's going to be good. I love a good brown. I know. But I really love whether I'll keep going back to that. You know, maybe you're like, oh, just for fun, let's throw in something a little light, but maybe just a little bit of that. Okay? So once you have your colors down, here's what you're going to do. If I pick this up and tip it, whatever color's on the top is gonna to dominate the whole thing. So we're gonna do the dance. And normally we'd take this and I would put it over a piece of scrap paper, but because I have show carpet, that's not mine, I'm going to use it this way. <laughs> so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take my finger and I'm just gonna start tapping underneath and watch what the powder is gonna do. That's what we wanted. So what that did is that actually took those powders and just bounced them around and spread out that color almost like speckled, right? And you'll see when I melt it exactly what it did. It also got rid of the excess powder and just flipped it off. So at home, you can have just a piece of paper, you know, or you can go over the trash can if you want, and you're just going to just tap that. So we don't want to like pop it all up. We just want to just, just that vibration is enough to get those powders and it'll dance right off the paper. All right. Once you have your powder on, you're good, right? You can clean up a snack, whatever you need to do, because our powder is on there. We know that that powder is going to stick to wet paste. And here's your option. If you let the paste dry, so if we let this dry for a good 10, 15 minutes and then we glazed it, we would have a really nice smooth glaze over our paste. If you emboss it right now, which I'm going to do, while your paste is wet, it's going to start to bubble and blister and create a whole different texture. And that's what I've done here. And the reason I like that is because by this glaze getting bubbly and uneven, it's also going to catch the light differently. And that's what makes this so shiny. And that's because it's not a smooth surface. 
It's actually really fractured. Perfect timing for her to talk. I will eat. <laughs> bad that was a quick one so when I emboss because the paste has to actually get hot enough to melt the powder some areas bigger areas you're gonna need to focus on a little bit and you're gonna see it like puff up I don't know if you can see it like blister up a little bit and another tip when it comes to embossing if you can hold your paper off the surface it will emboss in half the time right because heat has to rise so if you place it down it's gonna do two things one it's going to emboss in half the time the other it's going to make sure that your paper doesn't curl up, right? You have a card and you've ever embossed and your card curls, that's just because by placing it down, the heat has to rise. So that's what curls up your card. So by placing it this way, I can heat right through it. And if you have sensitive fingers, get a wooden clothespin just to hold on to your cardstock so you don't have to burn your fingers. And I'm just going around, love just making it shiny. You can see it just get all bubbly and good. <laughs> I like it. Mm, this looks like glass. It's so amazing to me. And you see, the more you eat it, it just gets that amazing, amazing glaze over the top of that. So this could have been done over an inked background already. It could have been painted. It could have been pattern paper. It really could be whatever it is that you want it to be. But we can also ink over this. So that is our oh, glaze wow. piece. You can see it just looks, just looks like ceramic. Yes. Pretty amazing. Neat. Especially because of all those colors. Because we're dealing with translucent colors, when those powders not only layered, they also created new colors, right? Because when that blue went over that brown, went over that green, we're getting totally different tones of blues. Like, where did you get the dark blue? Well, it's the same as that light blue. It just happened to be with some of that brown, which made it darker, and also overlapped with some of that green, which made it teal. And that's what makes playing with these powders so cool, is that we can color with glazes in a whole different way. Again, the same way we would do like ceramic or anything. So let's talk about coloring. Of course, we need to go in with distress. Right? Mm -hmm. We have to go with either distress ink, spray stain, whatever it is that you want to apply over the top. Just take an ink tool and we're going to go in and add some ink to this. Now, when we add some ink to this, here's some things to understand. By adding some ink to this glazed area, this is still plastic and it's not going to want to take much, right? It's not going to want to take anything because plastic, distress ink, they don't work well together. Distress ink simply wipes off. If you want to create a neat layered effect, one of the things I would suggest switching to is an oxide because an oxide contains pigment and pigment will sit on top of the surface. So let's take an oxide. <laughs> Perfect opportunity to talk about the new Distress Ink Surface. <laughs> <laughs> it is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is cool. I mean, I love the fact that, I mean, ironically, this is the first storage chin that I wanted to do with Ranger. And we've managed to do pretty much every other storage tin and this was the last one but it was worth the wait just wanted a way that we can store our ink pads you know we have a uh, 120 colors between oxide and distressed ink of pads not including picket fence and embossing ink and you need a place to store them and there's never going to be one container for all of them that would just be too much but this is more of a, a portable option some people really would use it for home but the benefit of this is that all of your ink pads are separate so they have their own separate channel. So when you're working with them, you can just pick out one color at a time. So if you print out your labels or label them however you wish, you've got that option. Another great feature is, you know, Distress has been out for 15 years. And so when you have this ink, you might have lids that are really tight, lids that are really loose. You know, depending on when you bought your ink, you know that sometimes you have an ink pad and you flip it and the lid falls off. The storage was designed that when I put this pad in, it's going to make an airtight contact between the case and the lid because that holder comes halfway up and that's what secures it. So when you have your ink pads in and you put that in, it's going to ensure that no matter what, even if you have a few pads out of place, those lids are not going anywhere. They don't move. So that was another important factor of designing storage. Now, the big question, how do you store your ink pads? Okay, so let's rewind, shall we? <laughs> so as I mentioned, distress pads have been out for 15 years probably a little bit longer now it's probably going in 16 years because I like to just freeze time but they came out in 2004 since that day when these ink pads were out they were sold in that display rack 
everyone want to look and see how are those ink pads displayed? On their side. On their sides. That's how they've been forever. <laughs> so can they be stored like that? That's how they've been sold since you bought them. Does it mean you have to store them that way? No. If you prefer to have your ink pads flat, perfect. I have mine flat at home. That's fine. But I also know that if I'm going to put some in a case and I'm going to travel with them, storing them this way is perfectly fine. If you prefer to have your ink pads upside down, again, not necessary, but some people insist on having them. You can pop out the insert, flip it over, pop it back in, and now your ink pads would be upside down, right? Because the case needs to sit up. It can't really sit on this little right. buckle. The other cool thing, though, about this case, and Ranger hates this when we do it, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> They're stackable. And I said, guys, I need another tin. Oh, just tell them they're stackable. I know, but they're stackable in the sense of this tin has a rolled edge and a recess lip that actually lock together, right? Oh, so they nice. don't lock as far as attach or buckle, but when you put it over the top, like you know that these are seated together. So when they're on your shelf and you're taking out a color, like you can take that and you can put it back and it locks together, so to speak. So a lot of thought went into it. It's totally worth the wait because now we have, like in my opinion, a nice storage tin for our inks that you can use your inks or oxide. So however you want to store your inks, go for it. I know some people live in very humid climates and they'll say, oh, when I do that, you know, my ink pads leak. I've honestly, I mean, Rangers in New Jersey, that's pretty humid and they don't have ink pads that leak. But if you do, then just, I guess you can't store them on their sides, but as far as hurting them, you won't. All right, mystery solved. Yeah. <laughs> so the next thing is gonna be about uh, fluid inks. I'm just gonna go in and blend with a little bit of oxide. And then I'll take my blending tool. Thanks. Got a phone. Thank you. Put that on. And I'm just going to take some oxides just to show you that when I go over this with an oxide, it's going to be completely different. The oxide's really going to be colorful and really get into uh, those areas. It's also going to change the top of this glaze. Now, when I'm working with an oxide, I just like to use different colors. I know this is already freaking people out that I just went with a blue <laughs> into a green ink. I, I heard that silent gasp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did it. Yeah, I'm gonna do it again. Um, and not because oh, because he gets free ink pads. No, it's just because you you really cannot contaminate an ink pad by dipping the blending tool. You know, before before we had the collector syndrome, and there was a time that you were just happy with one ink pad, but now that is no more. Um, because we need everything in every color. But honestly, when I came up with the blending tool, the blending tool was designed to blend. Meaning, if I didn't own all the colors of Distress, because remember, Distress started with six colors and then we went to 12 and that was huge, right? So when we had the, the other colors, we had red and yellow, but we didn't have orange. Are you kidding me? That was, a, that was an unnecessary color at the time because I knew that I could take my blending tool and I can go into red and go into yellow and blend a new color. That's really what a blending tool is for. So dipping into pads, it's never gonna contaminate the ink pad. It might stain the felt that's on the top and make you lose sleep over it, but <laughs> if, you, if you wipe it off with a baby wipe, really, and I'm, I make fun of it because it, it honestly doesn't matter. You would contaminate it if you re-inked it, or now that we have an oxide, you could contaminate it if I went from an oxide into a distress ink. Okay, that's a no-no, so stay within the, the ink family. But colors, if you wanna keep them clean because you have different foams and tools, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I have different tools at home, as I was there. Like, I have dedicated to each color family, a red, an orange, a yellow, a green, a blue, a purple, a light brown, and dark brown. But those tools do all 60 colors. So I don't have a tool just for sponge sugar or pick raspberry. I just like, oh, it's the red tool, so we're gonna see what we get. And it won't hurt uh, the ink pads. It's funny, because blending tool is a whole different tool now. You know, before it was to blend new colors, now it's about, oh, let's, you know, create that nice little, uh, soft little blended edge, which I think it still do. Yeah, but now we have a new color. Like, what color is that? That's nothing. Yeah, that's a color of goodness, but really, <laughs> you know, that was a touch, a touch, a touch, and you blend a new one. So if you feel a little risky and you crack them one just so no one will be watching, just sit there and be like, see what you get. I think you'll be pretty happy with what you have. All right, so now I'm just going to go over it with some water because, of course, distress oxide is going to oxidize. And that's going to create some really great layers on this. And we'll go in and dry it. But now I'm going to switch back to a craft tool because now I'm crafting. I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to remelt that powder. And two, I just like the fan speed of this. It's not going to blow my ink around. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go in and dab some of this oxide off of the top just to bring in some of that color. But you'll see when this oxide dries that that shininess that we had in our glaze has now been dulled and it's been dulled by the oxide because the oxide has that pigment and you can totally leave it like that. So just to know, another option is if you, if you really want to give this kind of those undertones and you don't want this shine, by just going in and using oxide over it, it just dulls away the shine. Still gives it texture, still gives it color, still gives it all that, but it's just going to remove the shine. If you want the shine, well, we could just go back we could wet this and you could just go in and get rid of that oxide over the top and bring that shine right back, right? Just taking that ink off. So you can leave it on, you can take it off, but it's just great to see some different ways that we can add a colorful texture with the Distress Embossing Glaze. I just think they're, I don't know, they're fun. They're a whole different way to distress. That to me is what I wanted to do and people go, oh, why are you doing embossing powders? I'm like, well, they are, but having a glaze that I can, you know, go through a stencil, a very fine stencil from Stampers Anonymous. Am I right, Mr. Stampers Anonymous? <laughs> That's Mr. Stampers Anonymous, by the way. That's Ted, yeah, put it on him. We love the detail stencils, Ted. We love them. Uh, we do. love them. Yeah. But it's really a part, uh, you know, that bubble stencil. I'm like, I think we should do a stencil of a million circuits. And he's like, maybe not. Maybe not a million. I'm like, yes, a million. Uh, I love this because a stencil like that, creating an effect like that's really unique when it comes to working with paste. Same thing with this. That doodle art is very mosaic-y when you use it. You know, when you look at the art itself, it's very florally and... But when you use it with a paste, it now, to me, it totally changes it. It doesn't even look so florally. It actually has just more of a, a pottery kind of look yep. because of the design. Right, so that makes it really fun. We love you, Ted. We do. <laughs> but yeah, having just having kind of a fun way to distress is well, I just love it. All right, let's talk about the cracked leather cardstock if I can find that. There we go. We have this little sample here, this little sample here. Cracked leather cardstock is a new cardstock in the distress line. It is 111 pound white cardstock. It has a texture on one side, white on the other, completely smooth. But the great thing is it does give you a very realistic cracked leather look. But you have the option of what color you want it to be based on what distressed products you use, right? You can use it uh, with blending, just blend it over the top. You can also take this and just apply your ink pad to your mat, whether you're using oxide, whether you're using ink. We can spray this down and we can press into that. And you'll see that when that goes in, that ink is gonna go into those areas. We can let that air dry and that's gonna create that effect. We can just take uh, crayon, this is crayon over the top, this is paint. Stacy taught me that trick. Yep, Stacy's like, ooh, I do. I'll, I have to give you credit because I never thought of putting paint over the paper when I was done. I would either paint the paper and I would know to go with crayon, but doing all the things and then just taking the smallest amount of paint like on your fingers, like almost nothing, and then lightly going over the top, that's where that gray came in. That really highlighted something that when it gets too dark, you know that you lose texture. Ever done texture paper and you add color, you're like, ah, oh, now I can't see the texture. And it just never dawned on me to just take something really light to go over the top. So, and that's the same thing if you're going to do wood grain, just adding some texture. So having a, a different cardstock is, is nice because we can take all of our Distress products, colorize it, chop it up, and then glue it onto something, which I think is good. All right, let me see if I have those little stencil cards. Probably not, oh, I do. And I talked about this in Facebook Live, but it's a good reminder, especially when we have a lot of videos going or demos and that is uh, these new stencils from Stampers Anonymous. A lot of the new stencils are very very detailed and in fact most of the stencils that we're starting to get from mixed media are just packed with detail you know. Let's see Dina or Di that have these bold shapes. I've got little bubbles and circles and doodle art. If you are committed to using a blending tool and you've been using a blending tool with stencils forever that's great but if you have any other type of brush whether it's a distress blending brush or whether it's any other kind of ink brush, see the difference. Just make a sample in your craft room because this is the same stencil done with a blending tool and done with a brush, right? So when you change from a foam tool to a brush, you're going from very bold lines to very detailed lines because the foam can only get so close to the edge of that stencil, right? But even though you're blending and twisting and doing all that, the foam can still only get so close. The bristles of a brush can get much closer. 
So even on something like this one, like Doodle Art, blending tool, blending brush, right? So see how much more detail and all those little extra lines that you just kind of lose in here, you're getting when you use a brush. So it doesn't have to be this brush. It be of any kind of ink brush. Just play around because if you don't think about that, you're like, oh, I just use a blending tool for ink. You really are missing a lot of great detail that your stencils can achieve and that they were designed to do. But you just, you're like, oh no, I'll just use my brushes for the edges of stuff. It's like, no, you, that's probably why they started with stencil brushes in the, in the craft hour for that very reason. So I think that is the overview. I want that. I'll talk about clear grip paste real quick. I won't necessarily demo that, but uh, the other new product we did is a clear grip paste. Now we launched grip paste it was a, a couple years ago. I don't know if it was two or three years ago. I lose track of time. But grit paste is designed to actually create a grit texture. This is perfect for Christmas time, for snow. You can add glitter on the top of it. This is a white gesso based medium. It's designed to bond to anything. It'll bond to glass or metal or wood or fabric or paper. But because it's white, you have to then go in and color it. Right? You have to go in and add crayons, paint, oxide, ink, anything like that. But we created a translucent version as well. This is really nice if you wanted to add rust, say, to a metal embellishment, and you still wanted some of that metal to show through. You can just go in with your grit paste, put it on your finger, spread a little bit on there, let it dry. It will dry translucent. You can either leave it, which adds a grungy texture, but you can still see through it, or you can go in and tint it with crayons, paint, ink. So everything that works here is here. This is instead of a white gesso base, it's a clear gesso base, which is cool. Yeah. So, any questions from your livers? No? <laughs> That's fine. Do you stamp, That's fine. What ink do you use to stamp over the glazes? If you're going to stamp over the glaze, you would use any ink that you could stamp on plastic. It's always an easy way to, to answer what ink do I use if you know what the surface is. So remember, this is going to melt as plastic, so you think, what ink could I use for plastic? Archival, Stazon, Versafine, right? That would work. So any of those inks that work on plastic, you could stamp over the glaze. Under the glaze, no problem. We could stamp with just regular Distress ink or Oxide, the way I showed here, or any of those other uh, inks. Just keep in mind how you want to layer that. And that's, I think, is what's going to, I think, really get people very interested in layering these with all of the colors of these and how they use it. Because let's face it, we can stamp with clear ink, we can stamp and emboss with Archival, we can stamp and emboss with Distress. It just depends on what surface you're working on. But definitely play around with it. Good, keep them coming. All right. yeah. I use uh, Baltic Birch Fire as yes. a substrate so I can get some fine grain mm -hmm. and all the earth things. Yes. But I do this over all the things. Yes. The heat gun and out. Yes. Yes. But on raw wood, it would soak in. You'd yeah, get the color. Right. Yeah, yeah right. you'd get the color, but that shiny glaze would just go right, right in the wood. Right now, as long as it's sealed. Yeah, it that would work. Right yeah, that would be cool. Nice. All right. That was fun. Awesome. Good time. Thanks. <laughs>